Let's get recording. Well, welcome everybody. I am Amy Eisenstein. Welcome back to our town hall, weekly town hall call. It is, I'm checking the date, Thursday, June 11th. I don't know how that happened or where the time has gone, um, but I am super happy to see all of you here with us for yet another weekly town hall call. And I am super excited today. We have a, a special guest, Rachel Hutchison oh, geez. <laughs> uh, from Blackbaud. Well, you know, it's my job to pump you up. You can be as modest or as humble or not as you want. Um, but I am super excited that Rachel has agreed to join us because she well, I'll, I'll read a bit of her bio and then she can tell us the most important things about her. But, you know, I've known Rachel uh, for, for many years now. We're on the speaking and uh, conference circuit, mostly with AFP and lots of other organizations around the country. And we cross crisscross paths um, on and off over the years, you know, probably less so this year now that everything's virtual and we won't be flying to all the conferences yeah. um, in your states and in your regions for AFP and other organizations. But Rachel is really a force of nature. Uh, the work that she's doing at Blackbaud is um, really changing the, or, the, the culture of nonprofits. And, and um, I think she, she's, she, she and the folks at Blackbaud really are a force for good in terms of what they do for the sector. So let me just read a line or two from her bio. She can add anything that she wants. Um, and then we'll get start, started. So officially, Rachel is the VP of Corporate Citizenship and Philanthropy at Blackbaud. She's responsible for global corporate social responsibility working at the intersection of nonprofits, companies, and funders. She's committed to the core philosophy that good is for everyone, championing positive change and inspiring individuals to integrate service into their development. Um, Rachel also chairs the company's Senior Women's Leadership Council, is passionate about diversity, inclusion, and equity, and serves on several boards including the Giving Institute and Common Impact. Um, so I think we'll stop there. Today we are gonna talk about a really interesting topic and the concept of ecosystems for good. And so I'm gonna let Rachel start out by telling us a little bit about what that means and what that's about um, and keeping in mind, you know, the concept that you guys are all here to, to really think of and be inspired but focus on how can you raise more money and navigate what's going on in the world and there there is a lot of that so um, feel free at any time to start putting your questions in the q a box for rachel to answer but i'm going to give her the floor and just um give us you know tell us what you want to talk about today and what's been on your mind what's most important that's going on and what you're seeing from your perspective Oh, wow. That's such a big question because so much is going on, which is so ironic because we're in this really unusual moment where a lot of things aren't happening. But I, I at the very beginning of this pandemic, I began feeling like, oh, it's just going to like, I'm not going to the seven conferences I was going to go to. My last trip was actually to Australia, to the Fundraising Institute Australia. Um, Australia. So hello to whoever is out there from Australia. And um, I had the spring is always so busy. So, you know, I was scheduled to be lots of places and all of a sudden that all evaporated. And I'm sitting here in Charleston, South Carolina, which is where I'm joining you from today, which is where Blackbuds World Headquarters is. And this is my, I think I'm halfway through the 13th week of being completely virtual. We went virtual overnight, all 3,300 of us. <laughs> and um, the good news is that for the most part, I don't think it disrupted our customers at all. And that's what we were really focusing on is that we really needed to help um, deliver services to them. And so we're being really cautious about moving back. So we, we don't have news yet about when we'll go back. We're supposed to get a, a month's notice when that happens um, as a trial, but we know we won't be full-time in our building World Headquarters until at least September. So I'm joining you from, from um, South Carolina and there's so many things happening in the world that it's so hard to hone just in on, you know, um, you know what the biggest thing is that I'm seeing or what's, because everything feels so different. I was just reflecting um, last night that when we do walk back into a building, it's like the whole world around us is like, feels completely different already. 
but um, I am a corporate social responsibility professional. I have been at Blackboard for 28 years. When I started there, uh, there were 100 people. So we were really tiny. And I basically grew up both in a growing tech company, but also in the world of what we now call social good. So for, for many years, Blackboard's been around for about 40 years, and I am not a products person, and I'm not here to talk to you about our products. Um, if you use them, thank you. That's wonderful, but I'm not going to talk about product. Um, so, you know, I grew up in this company that for about 30 years only focused on nonprofits. So I learned so much about the important role nonprofits play. I worked with them. I've been on a lot of boards, um, AFP and other things, but we also work with other groups that are deeply engaged in philanthropy from the grant making side and then also from the company side. So, and, and I'm the corporate social responsibility slash foundation person within my own company. So it's this really interesting intersection. And you asked about the ecosystem of good. So um, we use this phrase that what we do is we power an ecosystem of good. And that ecosystem includes all different kinds of social good organizations. And the easiest way to, for me to describe it is that you have individual change agents, so you have individual people who are out there in the world and um, doing crowd fundraising campaigns, doing things sometimes often that even the recipient organization may not know they're doing. And that's a much more recent um, social action kind of way of doing things. And we work with them. We have free solutions that they use. Um, the, we work with nonprofits of all different kinds, and the people on this phone, a call, know that nonprofits are not just one type. Like when you hear people talk about nonprofits, they think of just this one kind of entity, and it's really this incredibly diverse fabric of organizations, different types and kinds, you know, from faith based organizations to K 12 schools to higher ed to arts and culture to, you know, zoos and aquariums and museums. I mean, all different kinds of organizations. So we really work with what we would call verticals inside the nonprofit sector. Um, and then grant making foundations, which are a different kind of nonprofit and have different kinds of needs, but very much about the flow of philanthropy in a different way. And then companies. And the piece that we work with with companies is that um, again, what I do. So a technology solution that employees at a company use to identify an opportunity to volunteer, to join the team volunteer day that's happening, to make a donation if they want, to request their matching gift from the company. So all these things that, that connect. Um, so I think we have, we have 450 corporate customers, millions of employees that are giving, you know, about something donations is something like 110,000 nonprofits every year. So it's just a different mechanism through which philanthropy flows. Yeah, I didn't know that. That's super interesting. I wasn't even aware that Blackbaud did that. We've done it. We, we've um, done it for a couple of years and we made an acquisition in January of 2019 of a, a company called Your Cause mm. and we use their solution and um, it's wonderful. It's this, you know, if it, we're a little bit different as a company because we have 3,300 people who work with a lot of nonprofits every day and every single one of them is passionate about something. So we don't do big fundraising campaigns within our company because how could we pick, you know, we're going to do it about this. It's like, right. well, no choice. You have to have choice. Mm -hmm. And I'm very passionate about that. But a lot of companies don't have the same level of, their employees don't necessarily have the same level of understanding or they do wanna push a certain kind of campaign. And those solutions really are ways to engage people mm -hmm. and then think about things like during a disaster or a moment of social justice, uh, um, pride month. You can uh, say, hey, it's pride month and here are different organizations if you wanna give here's what you might want to look at and you can directionally guide them. Mm. And it's, so it's just another mechanism for how some people are engaged in philanthropy through the companies they work for. And I'm talking about a really different tone of approach than the old school classic. We do this campaign, you have to give to it. Right. So I'm just going to stop because I've said a whole lot. <laughs> Good. No, it's excellent. Thank you for providing us with that foundation. And we're getting some really excellent questions coming in, which we'll get to in just a minute. But first, you know, you 
prior to this call, we had talked about um, what we were going to talk about, and you had talked about some really interesting examples I would love for you to share about things that you're seeing. You mentioned a zoo, um, Pepsi in terms of a company. Yeah. Um, so why don't you give us some examples of things that you're seeing on the ground and, and different ways that we can think about this? Yeah, sure. So obviously this is a really challenging time for it to say that is, is just almost even just ridiculous, but this is such an unprecedented moment and a lot of organizations, a lot of people are suffering and um, that's absolutely valid and true. But in the middle of that, I don't want us to lose sight of the fact that there there is change and innovation that's going on that is positive. There are um, reasons to be hopeful. And for the most part, I think what the point I'm trying to make is, is around trying to identify the good mm. and the innovations yeah. so that we keep those things that we're learning in a situation where we're being pushed beyond our traditional barriers mm -hmm. and doing things that maybe we wouldn't do before. So. Um, you mentioned that I'm on the board of Common Impact, and that's a wonderful nonprofit run by Daniel Hawley, and it's an organization that helps um, provide skills-based volunteerism opportunities to companies, kind of being the conduit between the nonprofit and the company. And um, the, um, oh my God, I completely just lost my train of thought. Uh, you were talking about serving on the board of... Um, the Common Impact. Oh, yeah. so what she was telling me, I was talking to Danielle. Sorry about that, everyone. That's all right. Um, so I was serving on the board and she said, you know, people used to really struggle with the idea of skills-based volunteerism virtually, uh -huh. that they would offer their skills through a, a mechanism like this. But now that's just flown out the window. People are figuring out how to teach Pilates online and how to do like everything online. Yes. And so that idea that, that, oh, well, we don't really have any qualified opportunities for you to deliver service online right. is just kind of gone. And so we're, it's open, it's removed this barrier because this is what we have right now. Yeah. It's, it's removed remarkable. it and it let people say, well, maybe it's okay that I'm sitting in my husband's study and the light's not that great and everything's not perfect and let's just do it. Mm -hmm. So, so first I'd just say that, I mean, and I know that there's still a lot of hardship that um, these suggestions won't necessarily just instantly fix, but I did share um, last week when I was talking with another group, a couple of examples of, of things that I think are really wonderful and give us reasons to be hopeful. Mm. And one of them is the Captain Tom campaign. And I don't, some of you who are listening probably know about this. If you're in the UK, you certainly do. And so Captain Tom Moore is 100 years old. And in April, when he was 99, he decided that he was going to walk 100 lengths of his garden and try to raise a thousand pounds using Just Giving, which is a free technology solution that, that we offer for crowd fundraising. And he was gonna do this for NHS charities. He broke his hip when he was 99 and got such wonderful care from NHS charities that he wanted to do something to say thank you and basically honor them as heroes. So he sets out literally with his walker because he's still recuperating and he slowly walks these 100 legs. Um, in a period of about two and a half weeks, he raised $40 million. And it is the most wonderful, like giving me chills just, just talking about it. Wonderful story of this wonderful person who served himself in his life, just doing something simple. But it, it was that kind of story that just captured everyone's imaginations. So he blew his goal by 6,000%. <laughs> um, <laughs> to in the, the end, least, right? Yeah, to he, say the least. He raised more than, he got donations from more than 1.5 million people around the world many of them were very small, very small. And at one point, our system was processing something like $57,000 a minute. Like, you know, it just, it was crazy. Like you go in and you hit, you hit refresh and you're like, oh my God, like it just jumped. Oh my gosh, it just jumped. It was just this constant thing. He's been knighted. He got an a RAF flyover on his hundredth birthday. <laughs> and, and basically what it taught us is that generosity is alive and well that you know people's hearts are still there and it was at a moment where where i think that really mattered so that's one example that's an individual example in the ecosystem yeah it's a yeah. it's a fabulous example <laughs> i mean you know so We've seen so many examples of that, though. Um, I, you know, I, I want to hear the one about the Cincinnati Zoo, but, the zoo, um, yeah. you know, honestly, and 
there's so many examples of giving and generosity. And I think that's what's important for us to communicate back to our board members that people are giving, that people are being generous and that we yes, just yeah. need to tell stories and be authentic. I mean, that's, I mean, that's what's remarkable about him or maybe not remarkable about Captain Tom, uh, Tom is that yes. he, you know, isn't remarkable, but that he did just one thing that was so authentic and genuine, and then it captured all of our hearts and minds. Yeah, it was very simple. And of course, it was just the wonderful story that just took off. And, you know, you never know which story is going to do that. But, but um, you know, you make a really good point. So that at the very beginning of this, there were organizations saying, well, maybe we just should step back and not ask. People are suffering. Some people are losing their jobs. They're, they have less discretionary income. We shouldn't ask. You absolutely should still ask. Um, you have to be, uh, you can't be tone deaf in how you ask. Uh, you have to think about the day, day and timing for how you ask. Last week was a very um, difficult week. I know definitely in the community that I live in and then throughout the U.S. and in other places. And um, you know, thinking about connecting with someone when they're in a moment of pain or you don't know where they are, you have to be thoughtful, but, but not connecting with them, not checking in with them is in some ways like even worse because this is about us, um, you know, having community and connection with each other. So the, the, exa the other example I want to share is the zoo. So I love this story and I want to go to the Cincinnati Zoo. And if anybody's in Ohio, please go to the Cincinnati Zoo. So Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Garden, home of Fiona the hippo, um, which m many of you might know because we all seem obsessed with little hippos, even though I understand that big ones are really very ferocious and you do not want to get in the path of a hippo. So this organization um, used to get 1.8 million visitors in its park every day or every, every year. And um, clearly they had to go overnight to, uh, it's just the animals and the zookeepers in the zoo. Um, so, you know, that is a, a big hit on revenue. And so they very, very quickly um, using technology pivoted to having a very large online audience. So today they have about 20 million people following them online. And you can go on Facebook, you can sign up for their, um, I think it's called Home Safari. And what they did is they did a couple of things. They, first of all, have this home safari session. And I think right now they're running it twice a week. I think they might have been running it a little more often during the classic school year. And it was a zookeeper and a um, animal. And they would do a full show for the viewing audience. And so think about all those people at home with children and looking for programmatic things and looking for things to, to do. So this, this show became extremely popular with people all over the place. But they didn't just say, hey, wow, we have 20 million new followers, you know, as it was growing, they, you know, were in touch with us and, and understanding what they could do with tools. And they, they um, put together a program that was about operational, asking for money for operational support. And they spun up a new donation page and they asked. And they have an increase in donors. Um, a 500% increase in donors. And, you know, that's really wonderful because we can't go to the zoo, but the zoo came to us and the people it came to were saying, thank you for helping me wherever I am and providing something at this kind of difficult time for me and something really wonderful and more lighthearted. So that is a great example of, um, and they, they did that. I know not everybody has the same digital literacy or even the same digital capabilities. But one of the things that I'm thinking about a lot and worrying about is um, technology, whatever technology you use, is really important in this world. And organizations that are equipped with cloud-based technology, with things as simple as the ability to use an iPhone and an iPad and get on Facebook or do what, whatever solution you use to be able to connect to the outside world, that often has been the, the jump between the barrier between being able to do anything and shutting down. And some organizations have just closed their doors and shut down for now. Right. So it kind of makes that argument that you've got to be able to at least have the tools ready. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. So the organizations that have been able to pivot. So, you know, at the beginning of this pandemic, we heard from all sorts of organizations saying people are only giving to first responders and to healthcare organizations or to food organizations. But look, this is an example of the zoo. And they certainly don't fall into that first responder category, but mm -hmm. they were able to pivot their programs and services in a meaningful and engaging way and communicate uh, with people and pivot their fundraising. And you're right, Rachel, not everybody has the technology, but um, this is a perfect example of why it's important to invest why you need to have the technology up and running. Um, and you know, now, now is the time to do it if you haven't done it already. Yeah, and you know what, when you look at data, it, and I look at my own employee base, I approve our matching gifts, all of that. It's not actually true that people are only giving to those things. Sure, a lot of people, I think giving to, we had, a, a, had some food bank data where we looked at where giving was up 1300%. Well, thank goodness, because it was needed. Mm -hmm. But other people were continuing to give to things close to their hearts um, and giving to places where they're asked. It's just, it, it, we have other data that shows us a couple of things. And one is, is well, it's Giving USA data. And, and I'm involved with giving uh, the Giving Institute. I'm Blackboard's representative and Giving USA is the charitable part of that. And we do the report every year, June 16th, next week, it's coming out with 2019 data. But that report shows us that giving is resilient and there are off years, mm -hmm. but the average year over year increase is $7 billion. So whether it's war or recession or big disasters, over time giving is resilient, which makes me hopeful. Yeah. And you know, the other big factor this year is we have, we have an election year, a big election year. And people also think, and this is so logical to think this, it's what I thought. Well, it's a big election year. People are gonna give to the campaign, so they're not gonna give to me. They're not gonna give to us. And so we actually did a study a couple of years ago where we, um, where we looked at 400,000 people who gave to political campaigns. They gave $800 million to political campaigns. And we learned that they collectively gave more than $800 million to other causes as well, because people who are engaged often give more. Yeah. So, yeah, the, it's, it's, it's more likely if people give to political ca campaigns that they will give to charities as well, that, yeah. they're, that they're invested, they're involved in the community across the board. Um, so I, I'm so glad you raised that. And in the comments, Howard's saying, but fewer Americans are giving. This should worry every nonprofit. Um, yeah, what, what that's would true. You, yeah. Well, what do you say to that, Rachel? So that's something I actually think about a lot. And I'm, I'm, I sit with a lot of colleagues from the Giving Institute and others, and we've been talking about this. And there is a very worrisome trend that the number of donor households is decreasing. And it is. Um, one of the challenges is that there are, are activities that are happening that we, we, we call them replacement behaviors because we don't know what else to call them. Mm -hmm. But the things that people are doing that are of charitable intent or are social good intent but aren't captured, we're trying to actually incubating a conversation around how do we actually capture that and understand that? The other thing that, that in the face of this happening, because we do need to continue to educate um, people about the incredible need and importance of the nonprofit sector um, as more than just our safety net. I mean, it's, this situation shows that we need every kind of organization working together to build the social fabric that we rely on. But um, we do find that when you look at data sets, Donor households might be going down during a period of time, but the people who are giving give more. So there it's, and then you look at individual organizations and you see all the time organizations that can defy the trend. And a lot of that has to do with, and organizations that thrive during a recession, it has to do with connections, it has to do with relationships, it has to be do with really good storytelling, um, so that you're really in tune with people um, who care about what you do. Yeah, I mean, it's, I've been talking about this, you know, for years, of course, we've been talking about this, but for the last few months during the pandemic, and 
all data points to organizations that are actively soliciting their donors, that they're actively communicating, that they're actively engaged in stewardship and thank you and follow up, they are in seeing increases in giving. The organizations that are not sending emails, that are not doing mail, that are not picking up the phone, that are not communicating with donors, they're the ones that are seeing the decreases. Now, I'm sure there's exceptions to every rule, but the rule is that if you are actively communicating, engaging, storytelling with your donors, you, those organizations, even during the pandemic, during recession in 2008, during downturns, they are seeing positive fundraising results. And so um, I think it's really important to remember to go back to those fundraising basics and really communicate, tell your story, com continue to engage your donors in the best way that you can. I know it's easier said than done, especially with organizations that have small staffs and many people have been um, you know, cut back on, but if, if you can stay connected with your donors, so many organizations, it's not just the Cincinnati Zoo, there's hundreds of examples, thousands of examples that we could give of organizations that are raising more in April and May than they've ever raised in those months in prior years. Yeah. Um, so. And we're seeing a shift, I can tell you from just looking at data myself that, you know, of course, food banks and, you know, frontline crisis, healthcare, right out of the bank, uh, the, the gate, we're getting a lot of donations. But the last week and a half, it's social justice. Like, so it's like, so it's like what's happening in the world is actually shifting the donor focus. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, they're all, and now it's Pride Month. So there are people who are intentionally giving to support LGBTQ causes. So mm -hmm. there are all these things that are affecting the mix. Yeah, good. So Jessica is asking a question, Rachel. She says, how, do, I think she's going back to something I read about in your bio. So how do we engage senior staff and board members in mostly white organizations with mostly white audiences about the importance of diversity and inclusion um, when it doesn't appear to be a priority. Oh, wow. Well, first of all, it's not easy. I mean, so I often think about, and I'm not being political here, but I often think about um, the day that gay marriage was passed, Obama stood on the White House lawn and he gave a speech. And I remember him giving this speech because it was the same day he flew to Charleston, where I live. And he gave the eulogy at Reverend Clementa Pinkney's funeral. And Reverend Pinkney was one of the nine, the Emmanuel Nine, who was um, killed at Mother Emmanuel. And in that eulogy, he sang Amazing Grace. So this like day is imprinted in my mind. And earlier in the day, he stood on the White House lawn and he said, this victory was built on the backs of a thousand tiny steps or thousands of tiny steps. And so for things like this work, there is not an easy way to say, oh, you do these three things and you fix them. Um, you know, you do have to build advocates within the organization. Ideally, if you're talking about senior staff or board members, you have to, you want to get a peer who is going to talk to them and, and show them why it's relevant. I would hope that in the current climate, people's eyes are being opened who have not seen things before. I think that I'm definitely, um, seeing that around me in the world where you know all of a sudden you can't get a copy of certain books because everybody's reading them and these books have been out for years but there's there's a moment where people being are being pushed into some place that's new mm -hmm. so i've always thought that it was important to fight the good fight do the tiny little steps see who you can get to move someone along um, remember that you can't just switch them overnight to what you want them to believe the hard work is to me is working down the middle and in trying to influence and bring people along and help them see you know if there are examples that you can show people by actual talking to people going out in the market showing what the need is to make it real to them that that works too but it is um i mean there are generations in front of us who have been fighting these issues and haven't fix them all yet. So um, the resources are there. It's just more of a ongoing, consistent conversation, but in a way that doesn't shut people out who by being too intense or by being 
you know, not willing to listen at all. I hope that's helpful. It's just this very, it's the small things as much as the big things. It's being really intentional about how you curate who's around every table. It's about not doing something unless you can put diverse voices and people together and being really committed to that. Yeah. I do think there's going to be a real jump and there is a, we're in the middle of a jump where there are people who are saying, oh, wow, you know, that this really actually does matter. Just like COVID has taught us. Oh, wow, we are really interconnected. We can't just say, just rely on business for money, which is what, what many have said. And now all of a sudden businesses are supposed to help during this disaster, but they're having to lay people off. Like, so they can't just be there for, for everyone else. Yeah, so I, I was actually just going to turn to the, the chat box and ask the hive mind to weigh in on this as well, because I know so many organizations are working on this and have been working on this. So Chris says, um, as an African American, if I may, uh, yeah. be genuine, uh, Chris says, be willing to listen patiently. It's hard to educate up, but if you can lead by example, if leadership is not responding to what's going on, that's a symptom of a much larger problem. So thank mm -hmm. you, Chris, for sharing that. Um, I'd love to hear from others what you're doing at your organization and what you're seeing. Um, Yolanda says you need to have diversity as a priority at the top leadership in the organization. Until that happens, it will not happen. So um, I'd love for other people to sort of chime in and say what's working, what they've tried, um, mm -hmm. you know, even frustrations. It's, it's a major issue right now, of course, not just right now, but it's being brought to light, obviously, um, mm -hmm. by what's going on. So, um, so Christine's asking, um, and this is a, a 30,000 foot question, I think. <laughs> Uh, so what is fundraising's role in building community in times of trauma? How do we can, yeah, I, I, we're going to have to unpack this one a little bit. Let me read it and then I'll read it again. Okay. Um, how do we consider building support for the causes we love that extends and honors generosity to resources, um, resources as a way to bring community together. So what's fundraising's role in building community, especially in times of trauma? How, what, what do you think of that? Well, I mean, the, my initial just human reaction is fundraising role, fundraising's role is always about building community, mm -hmm. whether it's building community around your cause specifically um, so that you have these group of people who are engaged in whatever service you provide, or if you're an arts organization or whatever, you're, you're building community. And I believe that, I believe relationships are everything in whatever business you're in. Um, connection with people um, it, it gets you beyond that very transactional um, place. But I also think that um, if people are just looking at nonprofits as providing a service or a specific kind of thing, they're, they're missing the boat because there's so much richness in this world because of what nonprofit organizations do. So they also add to that larger sense of community. And, and one of the things that I've um, really kind of taken joy from during this pandemic is the way people have been much more vocal about how important the arts are to them. And seeing, you know, Hamilton on, you know, it's, it's coming out on Disney Plus, but they ran it. And, you know, going, to, you know, getting out of the box about how they might participate in something that's art. The, the, the view from my window thing on Facebook, these beautiful photographs of, of around the world, mm. the things that people are doing with art, the way they're sharing, the way the barriers are being um, removed is is so wonderful and that reminds us how important the arts are in human identity and human connection so i think all of that kind of goes back to amy's comment about storytelling that that i think it, it, community and fundraising are so connected and if they're not then you're being you're probably being super transactional and that might get an organization this far but not really far Mm. And so how do you engage in the moment? And that's what the best thing, when I talked about innovations and good, I want to keep, you know, capture that I love that someone did this thing that was so creative and unique. And how do we not lose that when we go back to a point where we're not so worried anymore about catching a virus and we're in offices? 
Now, Amy, what would you add? Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. I think that fundraising is all about community. And the question is, to me, really, how do you engage your community in times of crisis and not in times of crisis, right? What are you doing all along mm -hmm. that has set you up to be able to engage the community when you need them. You know, we always talk about fundraising as about relationship building and about relationships so that people are there for you in times of crisis. And so, you know, it, it's a challenge, but what have you been doing up until this point to be a good member of the community, to be stewarding people? Um, it's not something that's a switch that you can turn on and off when there's a crisis, but um, how are you engaging and building relationships and engage, being a good community member and good community partner, I think. Um, I, don't, I don't know. That's Well, and how do you know that? How do you know if you're engaging them the way they want you to? Mm you have to ask them. Yeah. So, you know, I talk about this in, in the context of employees and my world as a corporate social responsibility person. I talk about how our people today, it's very different from when I graduated from college. So I'm 52 and I graduated in 89. And I tell people that I graduated um, during the Gordon Gecko Greed is Good era, where if you wanted to, if you know Wall Street, you know, you'll know that reference that, you know, you were in it, make money, you go to business, you want to do well, you get an MPA or go work for a nonprofit. And now there are lots of different options. And the other thing that's different is we're not leaving who we are in the car, you know, in the, you know, late 80s, early 90s, you were going to work. If you're a woman, you were wearing pantyhose, you got out of your car and you walked into work and you did your job. And more and more now, like particularly because of technology, we are these whole selves that doesn't, don't get separated as much. And I talk about this as a company person, but it's the same in an, in an organization. People are bringing what they believe and think with them. And you have to, they want what I call um, voice and choice. They want you to ask them what they think and what they feel. They want you to really listen to them. And then they want you to give them choice. They want you to engage them. And they're expecting you to engage them in some way, but they want you to give them choice in how they do that to show that you listen to them. So donors are no different. People are no different. They're, they want you to ask them, what is most important to you? How can we help you? Um, and do that on a regular enough cadence that Sure, when something like COVID happens, you have to go check back in and say, well, this is different. Do you still believe this? But if you're you know, doing that in a regular way, helps you know your community. And if, you're, if you don't know your community, then there's a disconnect there. Yeah. So, and I think that there's a lot of ways to do that. Um, two of the ones that are jumping out to me, of course, are surveying your community and your donors. And the other one is to ask in person or, or over this. Um, right now, these days, I'm considering this in person. Rachel and I are having a- We person. are in person. Yeah, we're <laughs> in person, right? Obviously, just because I'm in New Jersey um, and you're in the Carolinas has nothing to do with anything. Um, but we're having an in-person conversation right now. So you know, picking out 10 or 20 or 30 of your donors or most active and engaged community members and sitting down and having a conversation and asking them for their feedback and thoughts and also surveying. I'm curious, let us know in the chat, when was the last time you surveyed your community? Um, and, and did you have a mechanism in place to respond? So, you know, I always say you can put in whatever survey questions you want, but at the end, you should have a comments box. But if you're not prepared to respond to anybody who puts in a comment, don't bother. Don't have one. <laughs> right, don't bother. So, because those people that bother to give you a comment, if you respond to their comment, they, the, the chances that they're going to be engaged and involved go up many times. So I'd love to know in the chat box, you know, there's more than 200 people on the call. Who has, um, in the last six months, sent a survey uh, to, your, to your audience? So let's go you to know, that. Yeah. Let's say that that comment is like kind of snarky or nasty. Mm. People will write down or email things that are far harsher than what they'll say to you in person. So if you get their survey and you pick up the phone and you call them and you say, I understand you have concerns, all of a sudden they'll have 
they'll they'll back down a bit and they'll have a conversation with you and you'll they'll say thank you for calling me about that and then you'll you can get beyond that oh my gosh this people must really not like us to a place where you're more connected in a human way yeah you know there there's tons of anecdotal evidence and i don't know what the data shows but that when you listen to a donor you don't have to solve their problem that if you just take the time to listen and acknowledge that they're frustrated or angry or mm. upset, the chances are very high that they're gonna continue to be a donor or even increase their donation. We've seen that again and again and again. Um, and Rachel, I don't know if you know of data on this. I, I don't, but, no. uh, but if, you know, you, if you, you acknowledge a person's frustrated, listen to them, say, listen, I, I know that's frustrating. We're frustrated by it too. Um, so far, we haven't found a solution or you know, we're not sure what to do about it or unfortunately, that's not part of our strategic plan or not closely aligned enough with our mission that we just can't do it. Um, just acknowledge that you've heard them. Even if you can't solve their problem, the chances are very high that they will be more engaged and more giving to you. Yeah, and I don't have data either, Amy, but it's very consistent with everything you also hear in people management training. Yes. But if you're, um, or even dealing with your kids, and I have two of those, um, you know, if you acknowledge and kind of put on the table, yeah, I know you're asking for this. Well, let's talk about this. And, and yeah. I'm going to be able to do this, but you know, I can't do this. And, and, you know, this is just off the table. Can't do this. This we can talk about. Let's understand. But people so appreciate clarity and often they're not as fixed and unwilling to shift as it looks like they are if you're reading something that they've sent to you or like, oh my goodness I you oh people over worry having a conversation when having that conversation can help you collectively almost co-create a better answer mm. um, but I, I always find it's better to be transparent and you can also sometimes you have to agree to disagree depending on how strident the person is but there's a lot of space in between that's not so strident yeah. So I don't want to get stuck on surveys, but quickly, um, you know, people are asking for examples of surveys. So maybe I'll commit to blogging next week about that. Rachel, if you have any good examples of surveys um, or specific survey questions that you think people should be asking, um, we can do that uh, together or you can shoot them my way and I'll post them on my blog next week. Um, the other question people are asking, somebody was asking is, um, Oh, if, if surveys are anonymous, how can you follow up with them? So to me, you know, either you can, you know, make it voluntary to put in your name and contact information. You can also sort of entice people to give you your name and contact information with um, free books or giveaway. I don't know. There's different yeah. um, enticements to say, please share your contact information with us um, or you know, you can make it mandatory. Um, so there's lot. There's probably pros and cons to making to forcing people to give you your contact information or making it completely anonymous. I would make it optional for sure, but then try and entice people um, to give me their contact information. I think by um, you know some sort of offering. Um, Rachel, any any final yeah, thoughts? Yeah, the only that? thing I would add is try to keep them short. You know, yeah. pick. The most, if you're not going to use the information, really don't. use the information, the question you're asking, don't ask it. Yeah. Um, you want to keep that thing as short as possible so that people will actually answer it. If they go in mm -hmm. and they start answering questions and they hit something that they don't really know, they're going to shut it and they're not going to do any of it. And you'd rather just get that quick temperature check mm -hmm. of a handful of questions if you can do it. Yeah. And so then you can always say, would you be willing to have a more in-depth conversation? And mm -hmm. some people will pick that. Yeah. Good. Excellent. Yeah. Three, four, five multiple choice questions and then a comments box or, you know, is there anything else you want us to know type of box? Um, and then you should say when you're sending it out, please fill out this three minute survey or four minute survey. Let them know that it's short, it's quick. It won't take more than three minutes, two minutes, whatever it is. Um, all right, so Chad's asking, Rachel, could you speak um, to your crowdfunding program? Um, you know, tell us about the key nuggets about your, how does it work? 
Okay, so again, I'm not a technology expert. So I will tell you that crowd, we define um, crowdfunding as something different from crowd fundraising. So crowd fundraising is when an individual raises money for a cause, for a 501c3, where you go into a system, it's, it's online, ours is called, um, I think it, well, it's Just Giving in the UK, and I think it's P2P fundraising powered by Just Giving um, uh, in the US, but whatever system you use, a person is saying, I care about my local humane society. I'm going to, for my birthday, raise, try to raise $500. And you actually go in and you can pick the organization off the list of registered, ch registered charities so that when the donations come in, they have to go to that charitable entity. They can't go to the person and still be charitable. So people just use these sites um, to, to do all sorts of different things. Um, crowdfunding is when someone does something for a non-charitable purpose. And that's a lot harder. Um, it, well, not harder is not the right word. It's, it's different. Mm -hmm. People may raise money for a surgery, for um, a trip, um, for legal reasons, for all sorts of different things, for um, uh, a family that's lost a loved one and people want to give for an education fund, but they go and do it that way versus going through a charitable entity. People often are very um, quick to emote and set these things up. The challenge is there is definitely questions on the fund, crowdfunding side. Some people have questions about the, the ethics of what people should be raising money for or not for. And then there's a higher issue of, um, I don't want to, for, for scams in that setting. So when you're doing crowd fundraising, you are, um, it's great because the money is going directly to an organization and individuals do this on their own, but there's, there's a concept in crowd fundraising that we think of as charity led. And that is, it's almost like the, the classic old, what you would call peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, where like the, the big run, walk rides would say, hey, you want to be a team captain? You want to have the thermometer graphed? You want to go raise money? Here's your page. This is a, a e easier, lighter version of that, but where someone might say, hey, if you're interested in us, hey, donors you, or people, you're interested in us, would you do a campaign? And charity led where they educate people that they could go do this. And maybe they're doing it around a specific moment in time, um, like an event. And individuals basically are using um, their social media, their social networks to share, hey, I'm, my mother um, had lymphoma, passed away at 80. And so I could go and raise money for leukemia and lymphoma and say, this is an honor of my mother. I could put that on Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and wherever and do my own thing with the money going directly through banking mechanisms to the organization. So it's just a, it's a, because of this kind of explosion over the last five years of individuals taking brands in their hands, it's so interesting that some will just go do that. Others will do it because they're prompted by the organization. Um, and I am not the expert about how you um, identify that best, best um, sponsor convener, that middle person who's doing that, that ask. Um, and that's part of the magic, magic in it. But you're basically, they're basically being a fundraiser for you, yeah. which is really cool. Yeah, that is great. Um, all right, that's good. Let's let's move on to um, Katya's question. She says data shows corporations account for only five percent of donations. Knowing this, is there value in pursuing corporate gifts? What would you say to that? Corporations are interesting. So that's that's the um, philanthropic side. There's also a lot of money that corporations invest that's through marketing that's not for direct philanthropic purposes. So I don't think that that number is as complete, but I, I do think that, I mean, the truism is real. The vast majority of money comes from individuals. And if you are not focusing on individuals, then, then you should be. And if you add the individual percentage to the bequest percentage, it's, it's like 80% of all money comes every year from individuals. I do think companies are important. Um, my experience has been that it's less of a model now of I'm going to go find the big fish company that's going to, we're going to be their partner and we're going to be the mechanism to engage all their people. It can happen. Um, 
but it's much more likely that um, you know you would just be one of many many if you are going to approach a company um, and it could be not even a huge company in your area <laughs> I often struggle with how companies are approached by nonprofits. Um, I always say, just treat us like we're another donor. Treat us like we're a person, which for some reason is really hard um, for many to do. Meet, try to meet with us and get to know us. It means you have to network and get a connection and find somebody who's going to sit down with coffee with you at a Starbucks and talk. Don't ask us for money the minute you sit down. Um, some of the requests I get are really... Um, awful like you've never met me but can we have fifty thousand dollars and the events event is next week and it's like you know so understanding that the company has its own goals and needs and if you cultivate a relationship and you get to know me and you figure out that oh you have that need and we're doing this well maybe there's something there you're like oh maybe there is something there mm -hmm. you're looking for connections and intersections so obviously it depends on how much staff you have how much time you have Individual major donors, I would put more time in. Um, individuals in general, I would too. But if you have good corporate prospects, pursue them. But it's more, it's a, it should be a part of your portfolio. You know, we had a Boeing plant come to town and I swear, ev this was years ago, every board in the Charleston area said, oh, just go get your money from Boeing. Not even knowing what Boeing gave to, that Boeing gave state to statewide initiatives within certain pillars. They're just like, just go get money from Boeing. So, <laughs> right. It, yeah. It does depend. You can be successful, but it is relationship building. Yeah. I, I think that's so important. You know, I think a lot of organizations or development directors, I should say, get tons of pressure from their boards mm -hmm. because the boards are under the misconception that companies have all the money. But if you show them the Giving USA statistics, um, and that that just a teeny tiny fraction of philanthropic giving is coming from corporations, then you should be giving, um, you know, spending the bulk of your time and effort. Yeah, I will. I will say that if you have companies that are headquartered or based in your town and you do have good volunteer opportunities, not every nonprofit does. Sometimes it's harder depending on what your cause is. I would approach the company as you wanting to engage their people in service. And you just want to make sure that you're recorded in whatever system or process they use for service days or other things that you can work together. Because when people start, number one, you're getting access to their individuals in a way that's meeting the company's need. But then when a company says, wow, we have 50 people going to the food bank and they love it and they keep at teams, keep asking to go back and, then you're much more likely to say, our people really care about the food bank. Maybe we should do something. Like you're building a relationship through service. And if nothing else happens with the company, you have people of all different levels who you then have a relationship with and you cultivate them. You doesn't, you know, what if one of them's an executive and it, it right. just all feeds each other. Yeah, the money doesn't have to come from the corp company. It can come from the individuals. That is where it's going to come from. Um, so very often. Um, all right, Rachel. So we're wrapping up. We've got five more minutes. So what are some key takeaways and um, things that you would leave us with? You know, what is Blackboard advising their clients to do right now? How can everybody on the line participate in the ecosystem of good? You know, what, what parting thoughts do you want to leave everybody with? Well, I would say that everyone on the phone does participate. Um, I think that it would, I would encourage you to um, embrace a really broad perspective of what's in that ecosystem and think about the richness of it not being just nonprofits, that it, there are individual agents out there that um, can help you help your, your cause through crowd fundraising, volunteerism, et cetera. Um, and I think understanding and learning the needs and desires and goals of the other groups, particularly if you're looking for funding from them, um, is the best way, you know, through relationship development and be targeted. If you, if someone says, go get money from Boeing and Boeing doesn't fund in your area, just, just don't do it. I mean, don't waste your time there. Um, I, I would just encourage everyone to look for sometimes even the simplest innovations 
and remember that we are all connected and we're all trying to be successful here so that when if we listen to each other and we're looking at things we can do together and we're creative about it mm -hmm. then you end up with this connection that probably is going to um, build greater success in the future but um, we all just have to rely on each other and um, I think this situation teaches us that more. Um, what we are seeing right now, I'll tell you that we typically we have a lot of customers and we typically work with about, hear from, work with, connect with about 10,000 of them in a month. And right now we're doing that in a week. And that's largely because lots of organizations are spending a lot of time from their computers. They are tapping functionality that they had but they never used before. They have new needs. And so they're saying, can I do this? Yep, you can do that, it's already in there. Well, how do I do that? So the, the training classes and the, the educational sessions are off the charts. So I would say tap into whatever resources you have right now to learn and ask whoever you're working with to help you to learn because the, the innovation and the excitement, I think is opening people's eyes to, I hope everything doesn't just go back to normal. I hope that we're better just because and also because other things are going to happen in this world and I hope we're going to be more prepared. Yeah, I think that that's such a good note to leave us on. I think that this is an opportunity and a time to learn, to plan, to really um, think about your fundraising strategy. I was just talking to somebody the other day and I can't remember who it was or where I was, but you know, they, they were a Blackboard user, they had Razor's Edge and they didn't know that they knew they could figure out what their donor retention rate was. And to me, this is a basic, basic thing for all of you. If you don't know what your donor retention rate is, uh, no matter what donor database you're using, it probably is fairly awesome. easy. You yeah. know, if it is a professional donor database, um, you know, some of them, I'm sure on Blackboards, it's right there on the home, you know, on Razor's Edge, it's right there, um, or eTapestry is that, uh, uh, you know, whatever, whatever you're using these days, it should be right there on the front page on the home screen. And that is something but but the opportunity to learn what you should be looking at how you should be using your data is, is critical. So I, I think that's a that's a really good point to end on. So listen, thanks, everybody. Rachel, thank you so much for joining us. It's always um, you know, really educational and inspiring to hear from you because you have such a different view and perspective, I think, than so many of the nonprofits that are operating more in silos. You have the big overarching perspective of looking at the data and, and have the big picture view of what's going on in the sector. So that's super valuable. Um, and, and thanks for continuing to be a resource for all of us. Oh, you are so welcome. Thank you for having me, Amy. And thank you to all of you who are on this call, because I know the work that you're doing is really hard. And I know that you're passionate about it. And I know I and my family and my colleagues, my community depend greatly on what you do. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week. And I'll see you next week. Have a good weekend. Bye, guys.